Uh, so yeah, today <clears throat> we're going to talk about chapter 11, which is about comparing models with resampling. Um, this is kind of a continuation of chapter 10, where in chapter 10 we figured out how to like make the resamples and fit models. Um, and now we're going to use those resamples to decide what's the best model. Um, this was, I, I thought this was really interesting, like all this uh, within resample correlation stuff that we're going to talk about. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, it's an interesting effect to, to take into account. So what we're going to do, we're going to calculate performance statistics for multiple models. Um, we're going to recognize that within resample correlation can impact that comparison. And so we have to do something to deal with it. Um, we're going to define a practical effect size um, and talk about that a little bit. Then we're gonna uh, do a simple comparison of models just using differences in metrics. And then we're gonna use tidy posterior to compare models using Bayesian methods. And then it's not really a learning objective here because it's the next version of the chapter, but we're gonna, if we have, depending on how much time we have, we're gonna play around with workflow sets a little bit, which basically makes chapters 10 and 11 way easier as far as I can tell. Um, so anytime you're working with multiple models, basically. Um, all right, so moving right along, oops. All right, um, so the first thing he, he talks about is just how to collect these statistics or to, to calculate these st statistics. And that's this collect metrics function um, and pull out whatever model that you're, you're looking at. And then he, you know, you do that over and over and you join them together. Um, I don't know, relatively straightforward. It's another one of those, just look at the code. But uh, workflow sets, I have to do some setup here of the workflow set, but then you've got this set of models and you just collect metro metrics on that whole set. Um, and you fit, like he has this workflow map and you fit that whole set. Um, this is coming into the chapter. There's a pull request to, to show it, uh, but it's like so, it just, I don't know, it makes sense. You set up some different recipes and then you just say that you're gonna pre-process them with these different recipes and you, you're gonna use this, um, in this case, this example that he's doing is just using LM, um, but he it, there's also this cross parameter where you can say, I'm gonna use this LM model and I'm gonna use a uh, random forest model with all these different recipes and the cross does all the combinations. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, and then, yeah, there's this workflow map function that it has certain functions that you can feed into it and it'll do like the fit across all of the um, recipes that you set up. Um, so yeah, that's coming soon. I thought that was really interesting. That's a package that's not on CRAN yet, but it's on GitHub and appears to work pretty well. The one thing I definitely have seen with CRAN packages, although he says he's probably gonna merge this in a couple of days. But um, if they decide the API doesn't make sense, the arguments are named wrong, that kind of thing, uh, they're very likely or very possible to change before it goes to CRAN. So be ready for that. But otherwise I'm probably gonna start using this right away because it, if you are comparing different modules, it just makes it all make more sense. Um, yeah, <laughs> seed eleven oh one. Yeah, he's trying to trying to set up something new. I guess uh, <laughs> he's not using his his very famous seed. All right. So now back to the the actual content of the chapter. Um, I stared at this for a long time before it finally like made sense to me. But the the basic idea is that there are some folds, there are going to be some folds that are just easier to predict than other folds. Um, and so that's where we're seeing like this fold is hard for everybody. This fold is easy for everybody. And so is this one. And he has the quote or they have the quote. I don't know which one of them said it. Um, if the resample to resample effect was not real, there would not be any parallel lines. And that wording confused me because, I mean, I guess there are parallel lines, but it's hard to see if they're really parallel lines, but they don't cross that much. So there is an effect. 
is what I think he they're trying to say there. Did anyone have any other thoughts about that? Uh, I agree that that wording is confusing. <laughs> so you're, yeah, I think I see what you're saying. Like, so yeah, if they didn't cross, then then we would say there is no effect, but they at least some of them do cross. No, it, so if if they didn't cross at all, then it would be purely or almost purely the resamples each have like their own character to them. But there are some like you know this one has a like it's always harder. This one is always in between there. Uh, these ones are always easier to predict. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're trying to deal with is there is some effect just from which resample we're looking at of how good can your model be or how good is good? Does that? So, yeah, so is the question whether the performance is being driven by the quality of the model or the resample fold it's looking at? Exactly. And so you, it's this whole, like a lot of this chapter is about making sure that you're actually measuring the quality of the model, not the quality of the fold. Um, that this, this fold just happens to be, you know, like w there's a fold that has um, super expensive houses and super cheap houses or something like that. That's going to be really easy to predict because it doesn't matter as long as your model isn't terrible. It's going to be able to tell the difference between those basically. Um, so I th that kind of thing is what I'm, I get out of this, but yeah, I did not like the wording here and I might have to, uh, to point that out. Um, and there was another sentence where he says like it, uh, it doesn't not or something <laughs> like there were a couple of double negatives in this chapter that I had to read a few times to wrap my head around, but that's, the basic idea. And this was one um, that I definitely found this chapter, I just had to push forward. Like when I read this section, I didn't really understand what I was looking at, but he talks about it in the later sections and makes it make more sense. So um, I'm going to try to remember that the next time that I'm banging my head against something, trying to understand what he's saying, that maybe just look at the next thing. All right. Isn't the message here that I mean, what this shows is that the random forest model is consistently doing better on this statistic? If it's, you just averaged all those, you would see the same effect. And yet they say that's not sufficient because of this correlation that we're trying to unravel. I, I don't see why this shows that that's not sufficient. So I, I don't feel like he made that or he chose like I feel like he needs to engineer this example a little more yeah. Yeah. to make it clearer that yeah, it yeah. does that. Um, because you know there are, there are some that cross over. I guess pointing at the screen doesn't help, but like you know, <laughs> um, this this comes down the kind of um, forest sea green or whatever that is, kind of a sea green. Yeah. Um, and the the average wasn't that different, and so the idea is look at. But within this one, oh yeah, it's way better. Within this one, it's way better. Within most of them, it's way better. Um, and so if you're just looking at the mean, you're not necessarily gonna see the actual impact. And also you're not gonna be able to measure how much better it really is. Yes, that's true. Um, because some of the change is hidden by the folds unless you actually account mm -hmm. for that. All right. Um, and then there's this little aside that I thought it was funny that he just tucks it in. He's like, oh, I got to mention this before I come back to it in a bit. So, um, but they, they point out that you should think about um, how much of an effect matters to you. Because um, we're going to be working on figuring out is the change statistically significant, but statistically significant isn't the only measure of significance. Um, Oh, this you know, if this model is just barely better, but you already have the other one deployed, do you care that it's barely better? So I thought it it was interesting that he had this little snippet, um, and then he leaves it alone for a while and comes back. But uh, it it is something that I think is valid to think about. Like, what actually is a better model in whatever application that you have? And so this the example that they gave is, you know, R squared two percent better. 
has to be at least 2% better to count as better. Um, and we'll come back to this in a little bit. All right, so then they do a simple comparison and they go through a lot of the background of like why to do it. And I um, left that off of the slides, but there's a lot of like the theory behind it. Um, but talking about that, you know, that we want to cancel out the difference between folds. One way to do that is to just subtract, look at the difference between the models across all the folds, um, and then uh, fit that difference basically and see if that is significant. And I should have actually ran this code instead of just uh, leaving it, but um, that takes us to me through well whatever we can load it up in the in the text um that this was just a it's a um it is significant but tiny and it was a quick quick check um you get a confidence interval and um you can see that the the, the models this uh example is just um with splines versus no splines with splines is better but it's uh what was it? It was like um, 0.8, 0 0.9% better. And going back to that, what difference um, are you looking for? 0.9% better might not actually be better to you. Does anyone else have any thoughts about this, this section? I thought it was interesting because he then goes into an 11.3, like, okay, yeah, sure. Sure, you, you can see the difference by just uh, modeling based on the differences. But then we go into these uh, Bayesian methods, and we can like really see the difference, and we can we can see the distribution of um, how uh, how the models compare, and, and whether like how how different are they? Um, it's harder code, but it's easier. Like I thought it was easier to understand what the difference was that we're looking at. And again, I should have put the graphics in the slides, but I didn't do that. Um, oh, and I did find this was funny. I should have fixed it that they have a couple of uh, sections where it says RQS instead of RSQ. Um, and they also had, oh, they had a, a repeated piece of code that is no longer in the book as of uh, an hour or so ago because they merged my my fix. Um, but yeah, the idea is tidy posterior lets you like basically um, fit a model of uh, a comparison of your R squareds. And then like, are they actually different or not? And so it'll do this contrast and you can say with splines versus no splines, or you can say random forest versus with splines or whatever. And this one I did actually copy in the summary because that's the important part that you can tell it okay 0.02 is what i care about and um in this case uh they come up they're equivalent 99 percent of the time as when you're uh when this is your cutoff they're equivalent 99 percent of the time so no they're not they're not different enough to matter based on the size that you set up um and that's the chapter. So, oops. Um, I wanted to kind of run through because I want to dig into, I haven't, I've only barely played with this workflow sets thing and it's total live coding in the form of, I don't know uh, what we're going to look at. But before I do that was, the, you know, does anyone have any other thoughts on the chapter? Oops. I just thought it was funny that the uh, ANOVA showed to be the same as the t-test. It's like, why do we learn those concepts? We could just do the base <laughs> thing. I, like, I mean, they're redundant concepts, at least in that simple case. And then it's so difficult to remember, okay, yeah, the lower confidence value is just below, or it's just above zero. So it is a significant difference, you know, in the frequencies perspective. But you go and do the Bayes analysis and it's like much more compelling. Yeah, I, like, I mean, if they had wrapped up the the simple test in a fancy package, it may have been um, as compelling. But the fact that you can just plot it and just see it and like they, it all just kind of makes sense in the tidy posterior stuff. Um, yeah. 
is definitely something I'm going to have to play with more. So anything else before I try to, let's see, where am I? Uh, just one question on the, on that size argument. Is yeah. The practical effect thing yes. that you talked about. Yes. So is that something you have to define beforehand? Um, you should, I feel like you should, uh, probably, but it's, it's more that like, um, let me. And, and I guess I mean define in the statistical. Right. I, um, sense. Probably. Uh, I'm not going to try to uh, tell you. I, I am not a stats guy. <laughs> so if anyone wants be, to tell. It, it would just be more rigorous. Right. If you declared ahead of time that like, this is my threshold. Yes. Um, yes. Like, I, I feel like it's one of those things that you can, you know, it's basically just, um, it's, it's, you're putting more of a, a stricture on it. So as long as you're, you know, like the, the reason it's more rigorous is, is don't go, oh, I'm going to go 0.01 because then it'll be better and I win, you know. Don't do that. <laughs> as long as you're making it actually more rigorous that you're looking, you know, let's say you get this result and you're like, oh, it's, huh, well, it's better, but is it really better? Uh, I need it to be 20 or 2% better. Oh, okay. It's, it's not 2% better. Um, which actually just looking at this, you can see that, that it's <laughs> uh, not 2% better. because only a little of the time is it. 2% better versus I actually, um, I think I've got this if I hop over. Yes. So let me change what I am sharing. Oops. To that. That. Um, when you look at the random forest versus the one with splines. Um, it's always like, it's always significant and it's, you know, centers out around like 3.5%. Uh, um, so that's where it's easily better on the metric they happen to set as the example. So all right, so is this the one that has workflow sets in it? No. What What are all these seeds? 55, 130, you're just like picking numbers at random here. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, well, okay, so this this was uh, before we had the talk with him, you know, but I wondered if he like went through and changed all the seeds after we made him <laughs> give the story about the seeds. Um. Yeah, it's funny. So um, let's explore workflow sets. Anything else before, oops, not install. Before we dig through, um, anyone have any other thoughts about the chapter? I th like, you know, um, Tony had said in the channel a couple of days ago to brag that he had already read the chapter, but it is really interesting and it goes into like, um, a, a statistical concept that I, didn't wouldn't have thought about um that oh right yeah the difference could just be purely from the resamples and so you need to make sure you rigorously deal with that basically um it's a little meta yeah for sure and that yeah that you're building models to compare your models um but it was it i think it's it it's good and it is definitely one that i'm going to probably like read again a couple times, especially after he uh, merges the change. Cause it's really hard to read the chapters when they are like, I didn't download it and actually build it. And so when you're just reading it in the RMD, it's a little, uh, a little hard to see exactly what's happening, but I think uh, I got there. I was gonna, so I, I did watch back last week's uh, stuff I missed from last week. I'm kind of surprised we didn't see any of like what was talked about last week with like 
pulling out the coefficients from each of those models and doing some kind of analysis on that? Because I know that's possible. You write your own like summary function. You can just extract, you know, use broom tidy to pull out the each of the, the coefficients if you're doing like regression or something from right. those sub models. So that would be a nice kind of, I mean, I know this, this chapter is already kind of dense, but um, I don't know. I'm surprised we didn't see that. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious um, if any of that kind of thing will make it into the final five or so chapters that he planned, that he said they plan to work on still. Um, I don't know. It, it seemed like this, this model, or this, sorry, this chapter was more focused on model performance than the characteristics of the model. Yes. Um, and actually, yeah, we're going to look at, oh, well, you know, different than what Tony was talking about, but I think next week is tuning um, for hyperparameters. Um, oops, where did I put the chapter? There we go. Um, yes. But, and actually the, the rest of the book is basically about tuning and um, probably some, maybe some model selection other than tuning. All right, but Workflow sets. So workflow sets is on CRAN. I mean, sorry, not on CRAN. It's only on GitHub. Um, it's not version like 0 0.1 yet. Uh, but he wrote, he rewrote um, several chapters of the book to talk about workflow sets. And it looks like it's approaching a like final API. Um, and so I'm going to run through kind of the, the basics of how it works. Let me, all right. So, so the first thing he does when he's showing us these workflow sets is he sets up a basic recipe, um, an interaction recipe, which is just the basic recipe with an interaction step and a spline recipe, which is the interaction recipe and uh, splines. Um, and then he says that this preprocessor, this preprocess set is the list of those three recipes. Um, and then he has a um, model, oh, sorry, um, LM model we defined somewhere else. Oh, yes. And it's just a, a LM. It's a linear regression with LM. All right. And he takes the models and he says that's just workflow sets with the preprocessor and that one model, and we're not gonna cross. It doesn't mean anything here because there's only one um, model in the the models list. And actually, let's do this. Make it a little more readable, in my opinion. Um, you know, we could say like, You know, I've got some other model set up to go and then we say cross and what that will do is take all of these three recipes and all of these or both of these models and do all the combinations when the cross is true. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, that said, a lot of times the recipe has to be different for a different model. So I guess if you were comparing different tree engines or things like that, that would make sense. Um, but if they're um, significantly different. The other thing you can do is the list of recipes can be the same as the list, same length as the list of models, and they'll just line up. Um, so you could repeat ones that go with that. All right. So once we do that, let me um, let me rerun these. We have this workflow that has the three. Uh, it's just recipe plus model name. So we see LM and uh, basic. So it becomes basic LM, interact LM, splines LM, and some info about how it's set up. And then we take that LM models that we just created and do that workflow map to fit reset samples. Oops, that's not the button I meant to click. Let's do F1. Um, and that's where you can you can run it through Tune Grid, which we're going to talk about in uh, next two chapters. We can do Tune Bays, which doesn't have a chapter yet. Um, we can fit resamples, which is what we're talking about. And then there are some fine tune functions. 
and I don't actually have fine tune um, installed, so I can't find those links. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, it's got map in the name, but it's not really like any function. It's just certain functions that it's set up for. And then we set the seed at that um, D apparently. Um, and we say it's verbose because we want to know what's happening. All right. And um, tell it what resamples to use. And we tell it that we, um, well, we tell it the, or we give it the set that we defined back here somewhere, the control resamples that says to save the predictions and the workflow. All right. So when I run that, that takes that object and it's going to actually fit it. So do all the fits and it's telling us that right here. Oh, you got to set that option. Uh, what is it? Tidy models dot dark equals true. Uh, Aha. That, that's an option. You can okay. Set. I will make a note to do that. Tidy models. Yeah, that bothered me so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Because yes, I was like, what? He, it's verbose, but just it's whispering or something. Yeah. Um, and so... Anyway, so it's running its, its thing, and it um, actually added all the, the fits into that object. Um, the other thing that he shows in the upcoming chapter is that he has this other random forest model that was already fit. And um, you can just turn that into a workflow set with as workflow set and then bind it onto that. So four models is just that random forest joined in with those other three models and now they all work together as a workflow set. Um, and then there's an auto plot function and actually he shows it with metric equals R squared, but it's cooler that it just, it knows that it's got root main square and R squared as the metrics that are built in to the workflow. And so it'll plot auto plot all of that and show, um, that random forest is best in both. Um, something that I don't love about this yet is uh, it tells me the model, but not the, um, like it says it's the preprocessor, but it doesn't say like which recipe it was. Um, so that's a thing that maybe could be improved here because it's hard to see what's what. Like, I don't- Is that because you're not feeding a list in that argument? Um, I mean, I am feeding it that I guess yeah I guess that it's there so it <laughs> should say basic versus interact versus splines but um actually um, if I do uh auto plot lm models right yeah see it just says it's a recipe well okay they're all recipes but they're different recipes so um that's a thing that I think could be improved um, and that was, I mean, that's what he, what he shows in what I have seen of workflow sets. Um, but it's really, I don't know. It, I like that basically he's, he has rewritten versions of the last few chapters because the idea is instead of all these times that he would like fit each model, it's, he fits all the models in one, one call. Or if you're like pulling out, um, the results of each model. Instead, you just pull out the results of all the models, um, which is cool. That's pretty much all I got. <laughs> Any thoughts? Any anything? It's a really, like, it's a dense chapter, so I don't want to cut it short, but I don't know what else to say about it other than what it, like, what it said. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, I don't do a lot of modeling, but with Carrot before, I definitely had tried to do something along these lines where you store each of the models in a row. And I don't, I mean, some of it, like maybe a tune control in its own column. And we try to do a cross and then like fit everything with like a bunch of mapping. It kind of got it, I kind of got it to work, but it was like, you know, kind of informal. And it, it's just nice to have like a, like a more formalized framework for all this. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
it's just it's it's getting really clean <laughs> that is the whole thing about tidy models is like it's getting everything nicely wrapped and um i, I think workflow sets like each package that they add i'm like oh that's what it was missing um and workflow sets is the current oh that's what it was missing that that makes everything just kind of work together really nicely so i'm um anxious to see that version of these chapters So it looks like in some of these more meta packages, where it's not about modeling specifically, um, like there's more and more upfront costs, like just in terms of setting it up. How, like in, in a like a real production environment, how often is that worth the effort? Like, like how 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 many people are actually comparing? You know, 20 models with different preprocessors? Um, I can definitely imagine, you know, uh, kind of like what we were talking about last week, where I have some expensive preprocessing operation that I do versus just how about if I don't do that? What is the comparison on the model? And so setting those up as just a set, like one set does the preprocessing, one set doesn't do it. Otherwise, the models are the same. Let's see what happens. Um, and kind of, I like that it re, it separates out kind of the like experimental design or um, model design, which however you want to look at it. Like, just think about, okay, what do I, what all do I want to test? Let's get that all set up. Let's write that all out, and then just go and do all the things and just run them, run it all, find fit all the models. Um, I, I love that cross argument because I can imagine that case of okay, I've got a bunch of you know I've got all these feature and these features that I engineered or I don't, and then I want to fit that using I don't know a, um, maybe like a relatively simple ran random forest or XGBoost and do all that you know crosswise of finding find which one. Or, it's not necessarily find which one works best because that's again actually where the difference can matter a lot if i can run a simple random forest without all my pre-processing and it's basically as good as my extremely pre-processed model with xg boost i probably want to just run the random forest without the pre-processing um and so i like being able to just do all that at once and see what what matters um and you know, like seeing, oh, the pre-processing matters, but actually the the model choice didn't matter as much, or the model choice mattered a lot, the pre-processing didn't. All of that kind of next to each other, I think, will be useful. I haven't actually done this yet because I, like, today was the first day I ever installed workflow sets. Um, but I think it's an interesting option. Do you know if there's a way of pairing recipes and models instead of just doing a wholesale cross? Yeah. So if you if you say cross is false, and the preproc argument and the models argument um, are both longer than one, it takes them um, pairwise. Okay. So the first argument of each, second argument of each, etc. All right. Thanks. Yeah. And so yeah, I, I definitely could see that being a thing as well. But I think the cross is where you really start getting into the power of it actually saving typing, <laughs> you know, like it figures out all the combinations. Um, but at whatever, there are other, pur you know, purposes because you do all the fitting and you can do all the tuning, um, which I also think is really cool that you could just say, okay, and now tune all of those and figure out the best version of all those models. Um, so uh, it will be interesting to actually work with that <laughs> and see how it goes. Um. Who is that? Ar Arjun? Is that how you say his name? You, you have a really similar voice to me. I thought that was me talking for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it was actually funny. I was like, hey, Tony, your mic's broken. You're you're a little softer than you were earlier today. Oh, nope, it's, it's Arjun. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, that's again, that's it. Uh, 
Thank you. Jonathan had to take off because it's the middle of the night for him. Uh, all right. Very cool. Oh, next week, chapter 12, model tuning and the dangers of overfitting. Very, very important chapter. Who wants to tell, talk about this one? Let's see who hasn't. Oh. I don't like to do the calling out thing because I know that there are people who are just, you know, shy. I haven't done anything yet, so. All right. I'll jump up on it. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Um, I will try really hard to have the learning objectives sorted out, but um, if I don't, you can still start without me. Um, this is, yeah, like I say, it's going to be a really good one, really important one. Looks like it is a little longer, but yeah. <laughs> Always feel, feel, feel free to like skip things if you don't feel like Yeah. Yep. This is going to be one that um, be careful how you set up the slideshow. I did. I erred a little bit too far on the side of don't actually process the code, but you might want to do some processing and like save off the data and then just load it into it because when you merge the slides into our repo, it rebuilds what you have and tuning can take a long time. So just please make sure that you don't have us trying to tune it over and over. Because I think eventually we do run out of GitHub action time if it has to run them every time. All right. I will see everyone on the Slack. Cheers. Thanks, John. Thank you.